is here. Welcome. Um, we'll be in the gospel lesson today, so uh, go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. And let's start in prayer. Father, I thank you for uh, gathering us together today. I thank you for uh, bringing us here. I thank you for the gift, uh, the gift of your word. I pray this morning, Lord, that you will, um, I pray especially for us as a, as a corporate body, that we will maybe see places in our life together um, where we have taken pride in um, work. Um, we have uh, used our service and our sacrifice um, for you in ways that are not glorifying to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, okay, so uh, after trick or treating last Halloween, we, uh, our, we all went out. I know some pastors don't do trick or treating, but we do because we have six kids and we like them to have as much candy as possible um, um, on Halloween so we don't get it uh, very often. Anyway, we went, we went and had a trick or treating. We got home and the larger kids had more candy than the smaller kids, a lot more, because they were very ambitious and uh, eager and they had more energy. And so they went door to door um, and they went the whole top, the whole block where the kids, uh, the little kids stopped early and they didn't get as much candy. And so we decided that it was a good time to introduce our little beasts to the concept of communism. Um, and uh, so we had them dump all of their candy into a common bowl. Um, and um, I declared, all the candy belongs to the people, um, represented by me. Um, <laughs> you will receive candy when I determine that you need candy. This children is called the redistribution, redistribution of wealth. <laughs> now Aiden is our most bourgeois of children. <laughs> he objected. That's not fair. So I pulled out my college education and I quoted Karl Marx from each according to his ability to each according to his need. You were able to gather more candy than you need. I will distribute it fairly. Aiden saw through that. <laughs> You're going to eat it, he said. <laughs> Well, Aiden, I am bigger than you, and making important decisions for the people is vastly uh, more difficult, so I obviously have greater need. Aiden repeated his comment, that's not fair. And I said, don't argue with your father. <laughs> was truly unfair, and you can rest assured that ultimately we gave them candy that is consistently, at least with what they, um, what they collected, assured that they would never be communist revolutionaries. We let them have um, their candy. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2 that God has engraved in each of us, or on each of our hearts, a sense of, and an impulse for, justice, fairness, what's right. Even the moral relativist who says, who insists that there is no such thing as a transcendent good will object when someone steals his wallet and appeal to transcendent moral values. Yet while scripture is clear that God has given you and me, given us, this awareness of what is good and what is not good, the Bible also is very clear that sin has damaged this awareness. So we can do very cruel things to each other and say very cruel things. We can think really dark and depraved thoughts and set out to plan deceitful actions. And we can do all of that without a twinge of conscience. God gave each of us a moral compass, but our compasses are broken. 
so broken that Paul says um, in Romans chapter 3, just the next chapter after he said we all have this sense, Romans chapter 3, verse 12, he says, no one does good, not even one. Read that before today. But God, in his work of redemption, when he set out in the beginning to save humanity, he decided that he was going to remedy, he was going to fix that broken moral compass. And he does that for all those who are his people. And I'll, there are three main ways that he does it. And this is getting to Matthew chapter 20, so if you're wondering where I'm going, just, just bear with me. It's an important, important point. First, what God does is he gives you a new heart. If you love Jesus today, if you love him, that's because God has loved you first. He's worked in you. He's drawn you to himself. And um, you have been what Jesus says in, in John 3. He describes it as being reborn when he's talking to Nicodemus. He creates in you a desire that maybe not a bit, there wasn't there before. He creates in you a desire for His Son, Jesus. And a longing to please Him. Now that may be as small as it is, a smallish, tiny, weak desire at first, but it grows and it grows and it grows until at some point you begin to feel bad when you do things that you know hurt your relationship with Jesus. Right, so things you were able to do before you became a Christian with no problem, I can think of a lot of things I did before I was a Christian without a twinge of conscience. Now that I'm a Christian, I try them, it doesn't work without me feeling really bad. That's because I have a new heart. That's the first thing he does. The second thing he does is that when this new heart, this new desire that you have, blossoms into faith and you commit your life to Jesus Christ, God comes to live in your heart through the Holy Spirit. He makes his home in you. Now, your new heart can be deceived. Even as a Christian, you can still uh, be pretty dull sometimes when it comes to right and wrong. The Holy Spirit is not deceived. He sees clearly. His task is to convict you when you go astray, to reveal things in you that are displeasing to God. So even if your conscience doesn't bother you, sometimes... You're going to feel the Holy Spirit say to you, ha, ha, no, that was wrong. It feels into conviction. That's all. Now, in this process of conviction and correction of spirit, this is the third thing, the third thing that God has given to remedy our damaged moral compass. And that's the Bible. God reveals his character and nature and what pleases him in Scripture. And as you study it, and as you hear it taught, and as you hear it preached, um, and as you hear it read on Sunday morning, the Spirit, if you're listening, the Spirit takes what is written and applies it directly to you, if you let it, right? Go ahead and do that. And as that happens, you increasingly are able to discern true right from true wrong. You grow more and more wise and mature. Paul refers to this process in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where he writes this, Be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you might discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So that's at the end product. As you grow in Christ through these ways that, that Jesus and God, or through these ways that Jesus is correcting your moral compass, you will be transformed in your mind. You'll be able to discern what's good and evil. Don't miss the imperative, though, in what Paul wrote. Be transformed. It's a command. What that means is that this transformation is something that you and I participate in. We're part of it. How? Well, one of the first things, the fundamental thing, if you're a new Christian, you need to hear this, if you've been in the church for a while, um, and you, just, you still don't get it, you need to hear this too. One fundamental commitment you must make is that you're going to allow your beliefs, 
your opinions and your ideas to be challenged by and corrected by Scripture. So, and you can do this. I mean, if you recognize, if you believe that your sense of good and evil has been dulled and is twisted, then when something in Scripture strikes you as unfair or unjust, your response will be what? What's wrong with me? Right? Not, I don't believe this. Not the Bible's wrong. I'm not, I've got to figure out a way to reinterpret this in a way that's, that's more comfortable. I mean, your response will be recognizing that we, we're, we're morally bankrupt. Our response will be, this is right. I don't get it. I'm wrong. Lord, help me. Always. Okay. Now that can be very difficult. One text in the Bible that always tests people's willingness to do this is Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. I preached Matthew 20 three times in my ministry, and every single time, every single time after the service or uh, an email later, someone will say to me, that's not fair. This passage does not seem um, fair. And if the kingdom of God works like this, I don't, I don't agree. It seems to cut against what we understand as right and wrong. However, if today you are willing to open your mind and your heart and be corrected and challenged by the Bible, you are going to find it to be very, very much worth your while. So let's talk about first why this seems to be unfair. And go ahead, if you don't have your Bible open yet, go ahead and open it now. We're introduced in verse 1 to the master of the house. You see that? He owns a vineyard. And from verses 1 through verse 7, the master of the house goes out to hire five sets of day laborers. Now, to be a day laborer in the ancient world was to have the most insecure of occupations, the lowliest of, of occupations. Laborers um, gathered every morning in a town or a city, a set place, and they gathered there to wait for someone to come along and hire them for whatever job was needed to be done that day. I used to live in Houston, and um, I lived in a kind of uh, poorer neighborhood, and right down the street from where my apartment was is a, was a collection point for day laborers, doing very much the same thing. Every morning, about 5 a.m., I'd see them traipsing to this site, and they would sit there, and they would wait for a truck to pull up, a contractor who would pull up and, and get some workers and go. That's, that's the way it worked. Same way it worked then. Now, if nobody hired you, um, in the ancient world, it was a really tough thing. If you went days and days and days without being hired, it was tough. Because remember, in those days, there was no social safety net. There was nothing underneath you. If you were a day laborer, you depended. You must have work in order to survive. And in that way, to be a day laborer was actually worse than, at least economically speaking, than being a slave. Because at least a slave had guaranteed food and work, right? You knew you were going to live the next day. You knew you could provide for your family. So day laborers lived on the edge of survival. All right, so our master hires the first set of laborers early in the morning. You see that in verse 1? The workday started at sunrise, so this is probably 6 a.m. The master agrees, you'll notice, to pay them a denarius. Now, that's a fair pay for a good day's work. If you were to translate that into our uh, economic system, it would be about, be about 120 bucks for 12 hours, about ten dollars an hour is what he was, he was going to pay them. Good fair pay, um, or at least it used to be a year ago, two years ago. I'm not sure if the minimum wage is gone up, but ten dollars an hour. Okay, so they agree and they go in this vineyard to work, and then at the third hour, you can see this in verse three, um, which is nine a.m., he picks up a second group. Now, this is something else you need to know about day labor. By 9 a.m., 
the best, the most eager workers have already been hired. Right? So if you're in this second group, that means you can get picked for the first group. I don't know about you, but I got picked last a lot for games at MTU when I was in, in high school or elementary school. This is kind of like that. If you're not very good at what you're doing, they're not going to pick you. And if you're not very eager, they're not going to pick you. And I saw this from my apartment window in Houston. I mean, you could see the guys who really wanted to work. They would run into the trucks. They would raise their hand, hey, you know, get me. You could also tell the guys who didn't really want to work and they were kind of itching back and they didn't get, they get chosen so much. So anyway, by, as, as we go on, each successive group of laborers is less skilled and less eager to work than the first. Right? And we even see that in the text. He finds these guys idle. That's when they're standing around doing nothing. Um, and he says to them, um, he didn't tell them how much he's going to pay them. He doesn't give a set amount, but he says, hey, I'll give you whatever's right. The assumption is that probably the same rate of pay that he offered the first group, but just it's going to be less because they're working less hours, less time. All right, then verse 5, at the sixth and the ninth hours, he goes out again. It's noon and 3 p.m. And the master finds more workers, again, idly standing by. There's no mention in verse 5 of pay at all, because these guys are just fortunate to get a job at all at this point. Usually don't get a job past noon. These workers are fortunate. And so they take whatever the master's going to offer. Finally, we come to the 11th hour. Um, that's verse 6. That's 5 p.m. It's 5 p.m. The work day ends at 6. So as the people said, there's only an hour left to work. Now these guys are the last of the last. These are the undesirables. These are no skill, no ambition. They just kind of showed up because their wife wanted to get out of the house and they had to do something. So there they are. Um, notice how passive they are. Why do you stand here idle all day? The master asks in verse 7. Oh, there's no one tired us. And I want to you where I was when I was a teenager and during the summer when my dad wanted me to get a job. And he'd come home from work and he'd be lying on the couch for big channels and he'd say, hey, did you find a job? No. Why not? Well, no one's called me. I put my, my applications out and nobody called me. So you just lie there all day? Yeah. So it's just me, 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 these guys, right? I mean, no one's hired them. They've been standing in the yard all day doing nothing. We do the, low, the worst of the worst, um, the least of the last. And he tells them, um, you go into the vineyard uh, too. Okay, now what is the expectation when we get to the end of verse 7? What's the expectation? What would we all, if you had not read the rest of this parable, what would we expect to happen? The expectation on the part of normal readers is that the first workers will get the denarius they were promised, and those hired later will be paid according to the hours worked. The last ones paid least as is fair. Okay. Now, ask yourself this. Why is that your expectation? Why do you expect that? I think it's because we assume, naturally, that the master is paying these guys in exchange for the work that they are giving him. That he's purchasing their labor. Now, if Jesus ended the parable in verse 7, the point would be fairly clear. God needs people who are willing to do his work. Um, God's best and brightest um, do the best at work for the longest time. We're entitled to uh, a forward blessing. Um, than the others. That's kind of a natural way we read this. It just stop right here. Those who work less, get less. I've been here longer than you, well, longer than some of you, um, and plus I do this full time, so in the end, when God sets things to rights, I'm going to get more glory than you are, and I'm going to be more blessed than you are. Tough. That's what I get for dedicating my life to this stuff. That would be the assumption. What do the twelve, this is a question, what do the twelve, you know, you've the disciples and you've read the gospel, what are the twelve always fighting about? Who is the greatest? Who is more worthy of honor? Who is going to be greatest in the kingdom of God? They fight amongst themselves, you'll notice, 
because that's the only arena they consider. They were chosen first, and they've been following Jesus the longest, so they're going to be entitled to the greatest amount of honor and glory. It's just a question of who gets the higher throne, right? I mean, does Peter get up there? Does James get up there? Who gets it? That's the question. Imagine how these guys must have felt when God took Saul of Tarsus and made him an apostle. The disciples then and disciples now often believe that good work, service, sacrifice puts God under some kind of obligation. Now, you may not be sitting there and saying, I never do that. All right, well, let me just give you a scenario. Let me paint a little scenario for you. You go to Bible study every week. You, you wake up in the morning early, you read your Bible, you pray your prayers every day, just like you've been told to do since you became a Christian. Um, you come to church on Sunday and you worship and you serve God and whatever. If you're in an IV, you serve him there. If you're in the church, you serve him there. And then something terrible happens to you. <laughs> you don't get to the church. <laughs> right. What's your response? What's your response? Often, I think, that's not fair. I've given my time. I've given my talent. You, God, should give me peace and prosperity and protection. There's a sense of unfairness when tragedy comes into our lives because often we do have the sense that by our works and through our works we put God through some kind of obligation. And so when that happens, sometimes Christians will go on strike. Well, that's the kind of God he is. I'm going to forget that. I'm not reading my Bible anymore. I'm not going to church anymore. I'm not praying anymore. No more. Now, how many here have been in church for, or been in a church, not this district, not this, not this, just this church, but any church for at least 20 to 15 years? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Um, how many, just two or three years? Now, this might come as a surprise to those of you who raised your hand last, but it's true. Sometimes Christians use money to manipulate the church. Did you know that? Now, if you've been here for a long time, you know that. Right? So, uh, the way this work is in, in the vestry or the board discussions, um, we'll be talking about a decision, and someone will say, Well, uh, you know, Mr. Smith doesn't want us to go in that direction. You know how much he gives, right? He gives a lot of money, and so then there's a pressure, right? And I don't know if I want to do that. Um, and so sometimes churches will make decisions based on that kind of manipulation. Now, sometimes people, and this will be a shock to you, sometimes people do the same thing with service and with work in the church. I work hard. Who else are you going to do? Who else are you going to get to do what I do? I work hard here um, for Jesus, and so I bought my I bought a right to throw my weight around. A few years ago, actually two years ago, um, I remember this. Uh, there was a conversation between a person who had been here for a long time and a person who had just joined a year ago, and this person who had just joined a year ago had, had taken part in a dinner or something, I forgot what it was, but he, he, he or she, I'm not going to specify that, worked hard and, and did well. And then the person who had been here for a long time said, oh, well now you're finally one of us. Now you're in. Really, I, I thought that it was when that person was brought to faith in Jesus Christ and was baptized. I thought that's when that person became a member of the church. But no, it was also when that person helped with the harvest dinner or whatever thing is going on. Right? Sometimes we in the church can use our work in a manipulative way. I'm going to do this, I'm going to sacrifice this, I'm going to do this time. And then I expect to have a certain amount of weight and power for my coming behind my opinions because of what I do. Now that's 
precisely the thinking that Jesus wants to undermine. Both as we relate to God and try to put Him under obligation, and as we relate to each other and try to put each other under some kind of obligation. The last are paid first, and they receive exactly as much as the first. The first workers grumble. Why? Because they had they thought of their work as something that was going to earn them uh, more, uh, that was going to put the, the master under some kind of obligation. The first workers grumble. But the master says, and listen to this, I chose to give to this last worker as I give you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? That word there, generosity, is the key that unlocks this parable. Look more closely at the master. The master did not hire these workers because he needed their work. How do I know? How do I know? Two reasons. If the master needed workers in his vineyard because his livelihood depended on their production, which is what we assume when we read the story, then he would have hired everyone up front and gotten a full day's work. I mean, if he was going to pay them a denarius, and I was going to get the full day's work out of all of them, he would have hired just a few and gone back to get a few more and gone back to get a few more. He would have hired them all for a full day's work. Second, if he were truly in need of laborers, and let's just say he made a mistake and didn't get as many as he needed in the first place, then he would definitely link work hours with pay. If I hire someone to come and do some work at my house at 12 bucks an hour, I'm not paying them $144 for one hour of work. Who's not doing that? A guy who throws money around like the master doesn't need day laborers. He could buy slaves. He could hire permanent servants who he could train and work well. He didn't have to go after the lowest of the low laborers. There's no economic reason to hire the lowest skilled workers except to save money. And by the behavior of the master, we see that's not what he's doing. He's not trying to save himself any money. So what that tells us, and I think what Jesus is telling us, is that the master in this case is on a mission of mercy. He hires the first workers because he wants to give them a denarius. He hires the last workers because he wants to give them a denarius. Who worked how long isn't important because nobody was hired for his or her work anyway. Everyone in the vineyard is there because the master is generous. The workers aren't in the vineyard because they're good workers. They're not in there because they're good. They're in there because the master is good. So no worker need look down on another. Now this, Jesus tells us, he told us in the beginning, is a parable about the kingdom of heaven. Now, when we think the kingdom of heaven, we're not talking about the floating place with wings and harps and naked babies, right? That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. So don't think that, right? We're thinking, when we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, we're talking right here. This is what the world, the cosmos, will look like when God has his way. When Christ establishes his kingdom, that's what the world will look like. And right now, this is what the church should look like. The story communicates truth about us or who we should be. And the first thing that we can draw from it is that entry into God's kingdom is not based on anything you've done in the past or will do. You have nothing to offer that God needs. 
Nothing. He's not out looking for the best and the brightest. I mean, obviously, he's not out looking for the best and the brightest and picking those ones that he thinks are their skills and their talents. They're going to be really good for my kingdom, so I've got to get this guy. Look at his disciples. Obviously, that is not what he was doing. Look at me. Look at yourselves. That's obviously not what he's doing. We're, we're kind of, no, I mean, I can think of a lot of people that Jesus could have picked to be a better preacher, a better pastor than I am, but he, he did that. He brought me in here. You have nothing to offer that God needs. God's not looking for the best and the brightest. The only necessary work in the vineyard has been done already by God in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, God paid the penalty for your sins. In Jesus, he lived a holy life without sin in your place because you can't. That is the work. He did it. He accomplished it. It's done. He created the vineyard. He planted the vines. He harvested the grapes. There's nothing left for you to do that he needs done. And so if you didn't come in to the kingdom, it's not like God would be without hope. Right? He's got it. So since he has done all the work, there's nothing left but for you to accept his invitation to enter the vineyard. Right? That's the first thing we can draw from. Now the second thing we should learn here is that um, while he does not need your work, he does want your work. It's kind of a hard concept. Why? Why? He's done all the work. What does he want us in here for? Um, it reminds me of the time when I was six. When I was six, my dad um, installed a fireplace in the house where we were living, which was kind of scary since my dad's an attorney, you know. <laughs> he doesn't know how to do any of that stuff, but, um, but he, I remember he installed the fireplace. The reason I remember he did this is because he came to my room that morning and he said, Hey, Matt, um, do you want to help me put this fireplace in? And uh, if he asked me like, 10 years later, I would say, no way. But I was six, and so I was extremely excited. Yes, I'm going to help you with um, the fireplace. And so I got my little tool up on, my plastic hammer, and I was there. I was ready to go. And I remember this so well because what my dad did is he took time, he taught me how to saw with a real saw and a hammer with a real hammer. And I, he, he talked to me like I was an adult and like I was really helping him do his work and how, how difficult it would be for him to do it without me. And at the end of the day, he paid me. He gave me like a dollar. I don't know how much it was. Now, I know that my dad did not need me to help him work on the fireplace. And he could have got it done a lot faster and a lot better without me. So why did he ask me to help? He asked me to help because he doesn't, he didn't need my help. He wanted my help. He wanted me to be, to, to be with him. He loves me. He wants me to be by his side. And to teach me what he does and how he does it. All of the work I've done as a follower of Jesus, since I became a follower of Jesus, is exactly like that. All of it. All of the work you have done since you became a follower of Jesus is like that. I don't give God something he can't get by himself. He's called me into his vineyard for my good. For my good, not for his. He doesn't need me, he wants me. He doesn't need you either, but he wants you. Third lesson to draw, um, I know um, that elsewhere in Scripture the Bible does teach, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, for example, the Bible does teach that some will receive rewards in heaven and those rewards will be less for some and greater for others. That's a true teaching of the Scriptures. This teaching doesn't contradict that because that's not the point of this teaching. Jesus is not telling this parable to say everyone will receive the same thing in heaven. That's not the point of this. The point of this is this. Um, he is reframing our lives before God and with each other. 
He's re helping us to reprogram our minds as we think about God and each other. And his point is that we are all equally unneeded and all equally wanted. We are all in Christ going to live forever in the same kingdom for the same eternity. And it's only because we have been uh, called and rescued from our sins by the same God who paid the same price for us all. That's the denarius. But the price that our God paid is much more than the denarius. He spent his body and he spent his blood and he spent his soul and his divinity. So that we can be with him and his family. That's what he did. Every moment, every second of your Christian life, from beginning to end, is surrounded by and embraced by grace. Unmerited, undeserved blessing and love and gifting from God. All of it. He gives as much grace to me when he invited me to the kingdom uh, 15 years ago as he gives to you if you just came in the last year. It's all there. He gives him his full self to everyone. And so since that's true, you and I, um, in this thing, sacrifice ourselves, we work hard, we do our best, to please Jesus because Jesus is beside us, loving us, and teaching us about himself. But we don't stand over our brothers or our sisters and use our work as a weapon. Use our, our standing, our, the effort that we put forth as a way to look down on each other. All right, I'm going to stop here. Do what with you. Awesome. Father, we thank you for um, this parable in his teaching, um, I think this hits Good Shepherd straight uh, to the eyes. Um, we are a church, Lord, who, all of us, we do so many, there's so many people here who do so many things. And there is temptation in that word to use or to see our work as a means of elevating ourselves. And you saved us, you justified us by grace, and you did it by grace so that no one can boast. Lord, correct us. If there's anyone here who, um, who needs this morning to repent of pride and um, manipulating their work in, this, in the church for um, gain, I pray that you'll bring them to repentance. I pray if there's anyone here who um, needs uh, support and love because they've fallen down and don't work very much or very hard, that you encourage them, give them up. I pray for anyone here who's not yet entered your vineyard that they will hear your call and enter um, this day. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together.